Hello everyone, this is Tom Fox and I would like to welcome you to episode 133 of the FCPA Compliance and Ethics Report. Today I'm pleased to continue my series with Jay Rosen on the Oscars and Compliance. It is part five. We are going to give our Oscar selections or at least our picks for this Sunday's Oscars. The episode comes in at just over 26 minutes. We're going to tie it to some compliance concepts. I hope you enjoy the episode. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Tom Fox, and I would like to welcome you to this episode of the FCPA Compliance and Ethics Report. Today, I continue my exploration of compliance and Oscars with Jerry Rosen, and we're going to detour into the nominees this year themselves and give our predictions for the upcoming ceremony on Sunday. So, uh, welcome back, Jay. Thanks, Tom. Let's uh, let's get ready to give out some uh, ethics and compliance gold statuettes. Absolutely. So, um, I would suggest we just start with uh, start with the big one, big picture. Or excuse me, best picture, big picture, best picture. We have eight nominees this year. They are American Sniper, Birdman, Boyhood, The Grand Budapest Hotel, The Imitation Game, Selma. The Theory of Everything, and Whiplash. And, Jay, I would have to say that this is one of the, since the expanded field, I think this is the strongest uh, we've seen since it went from five to more than five. But um, really with the exception of Whiplash, I found every one of these to be worthy of at least a Best Picture nomination. Yeah, I I would agree. And it it really does, um, you know, demonstrate the breadth of the Academy and, what they were trying to achieve when they expanded this um, category several years ago. Um, it's, 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 a, it's a difficult call because there's some, some great little art pictures. There's some real um, moving social pictures. And um, I'm going to go out uh, against what uh, all the other guilds have been saying, but I think with the fact that uh, there's a trial going on now um, about the uh, – guy who uh you know tried to kill who killed the protagonist an american sniper i think um the academy loves clint eastwood and uh you know he does three bad movies and one good movie and this is his good movie year so i'm going to pick american sniper uh in light of all the other uh prevailing wisdom with uh people supporting birdman and boyhood uh, what's your call on this one well, uh, first of all, I have to say I cannot disagree with that. Uh, for a picture uh, taken in total, uh, I think it represents really some of the best of American filmmaking. Uh, it really brought home on an individual basis to me the, what soldiers have to go through, uh, both in combat and, and when they return home. Um, I, had not, I had not really focused on the Clint Eastwood aspect, but I note that he is not – nominated for Best Director, and I think the, uh, the Academy's had a recent tradition of splitting the awards. Uh, the uh, Best uh, Director does not, picture does not receive Best Picture Awards, so that may le- lend some credence to your analysis as well. Um, you know, the Grand Budapest Hotel, I thought was one of the most, uh, you know, you could say it's typical Wes Anderson, but I found it to be one of the most creatively entertaining movies I've seen recently. Certainly Selma. Uh, The the debates over whether the history is correct, I think it's misplaced. Movies aren't history. Histories aren't movies generally. Uh, A movie is a movie, and it's there to tell a story. Um, It's like complaining that uh, the movie, um, the graphic movie 300 was bad history uh, about Sparta and uh, its uh, battle against the Persians. Anything that kind of uh, re-energizes the debate of historical significance I think it's the purpose of a movie, so you know, kudos to Selma. Uh, certainly, um, uh, the Imitation Game and the Theory of Everything, uh, I thought were just excellent pictures. Uh, Boyhood, uh, Richard Linklater did a very creative and interesting uh, turn with uh, the way he um, structured that film. But I'm going to have to go with Birdman. And I know that's the conventional wisdom, but in this case, I think the conventional wisdom may be right. I thought the uh, the storyline, uh, America and particularly Hollywood love a second act and a comeback. And uh, if, if Michael Keaton wasn't born for that role, he certainly trained for it the last 30 years and all of his other movies. So um, I'm going to have to go with Birdman on that one. 
All right, and 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 I don't think either choice is a bad choice. So, uh, you right. know, um, I think it's a great category. Uh, let's move on next to. Uh, uh, let's turn this around a little bit and let's go for best actress first. Oh, okay. And, and we have uh, people nominated for five films. The majority of these nominations are all going to be five. Uh, hopefully, I do not butcher her name, but we have Marion Cotillard for Two Days, One Night, uh, Felicity Jones, who is wonderful in the theory of everything. Uh, Julianne Moore, who has one of these uh, probably career-defining performances in Still Alice, uh, Rosamund Pike in Gone Girl, and Reese Witherspoon in Wild. Um, I, I think that this is going to be a situation where there's going to be a lot of canceling out between some of the younger actresses, and I think uh, Julianne Moore is going to get one of those Oscars, uh, which is not only for this uh, bravura performance, but also kind of a, a nod to the type of uh, consistent acting that she's done in her career. You know, Jay, once again, I cannot disagree with uh, your analysis. Um, I thought uh, Reese Witherspoon in many ways carried wild uh, by the nature of the picture. Uh, it really focused on her and her personal journey, both her you know, uh, emotional, uh, psychic, and physical journey in her hiking. Um, Rosamund Pike, who I've just adored since she was in, I saw her in a James Bond movie years ago. Uh, I can't say that she really, uh, she got nominated for Best Actress. I loved her performance, but I'm not sure the level of the performance or level of the role was as much as some of these other women. You were absolutely right about Phyllis and Jones. Uh, but I'm going to have to join you on the conventional wisdom with Julianna Moore. Um, I, I think when you open your remarks with career-defining role, that's what this movie was to me uh, about her. And I've seen her in a lot of things. Uh, fortunately, she's one of the women who likes to take her clothes off, so we, we get to see a lot of her. Uh, but um, she really did uh, just a tour de force in this job, and uh, – I thought she carried the picture, and, and that's not much more that you can ask of an actress uh, to carry a picture. So um, maybe we both agree on that one. Yeah, and the the um, you know final capper on that is I I think it's also nice to see uh, actors getting nominated for best actress that have media roles. So to your point earlier with Reese Witherspoon, you know it's basically a character piece about her. She's carrying that movie. And uh, as is, you know, when you look at some of the other roles, too, I mean, Felicity Jones, uh, the things that she has to go through in that moving, uh, that movie to uh, take care of, uh, you know, Keating is amazing. So it's no longer somebody uh, who is being a prop in a story, but it's nice to see fuller-blown characters being written not only for women, but women of a certain age because uh, – you know, Julianne Moore is not the ingenue anymore, but she still plays real vibrant mo roles. She's been in science fiction. She's been in drama. She's been in comedy. So she really can play it all. Agreed. And I guess in one other nod to her, uh, this may be moving towards a, a sort of a, uh, a career celebration or a celebration of her career type Oscar uh, because she's been around so long, done so, so many different things and so many great things. So. Um, glad we agree on that one. Uh, All right, let's, so let's go to the boys to, now. Okay, best actor. Uh, we've got five up. We've got Steve Carroll, uh, kind of playing against talking, uh, playing against cast in Foxcatcher. We have Bradley Cooper in the aforementioned American Sniper, every woman's favorite Benedict Cumberbatch in the Imitation Game, Michael Keaton in Birdman, and Eddie uh, Redmayne in the Theory of Everything. Uh, once again, a, a, a very strong field. So uh, how do you break it down? Uh, I guess I'm just feeling very militaristic, and um, I just love the intensity of Bradley Cooper's role in American Sniper, and it's, uh, you know, one of the ways that I kind of judge an actor is the range. And, you know, the first time I ever became aware of um, Bradley Cooper was in Wedding Crashers, and he uh, perfected the role of playing a dick. <laughs> and, uh, you know, from that on, he, he went into the um, 
Oh, uh, what, what what are those bachelor movies called that happen in Vegas? Um, bachelor party. Yeah, well, not no, not bachelor party. It's something else, but it's the one with uh, yeah, yeah, Zach okay. Galifianakis. Which yeah. one? No, yeah. I don't know what you mean. Mike Tyson. Yeah. The Mike Tyson movies. Yeah. So anyhow, for I love it. Uh, I think my theory is is, uh, and this was kind of uh, you know discussed last week in the. Uh, too long, three and a half hour SNL 40th uh, anniversary thing, but I think some of your best actors um, usually start off as comedians, and you know that's why you see something like Keaton being so strong and Tom Hanks always being a very strong dramatic actor. So uh, I wouldn't necessarily uh, classify Bradley Cooper as a comedian, but uh, with the state of the world, with the, uh, with so much unrest and so much war. It really uh, gives me an appreciation for those uh, people who work around the world daily to defend our freedom. So although I think it's probably going to be a nod to Keaton for his career, and I love Eddie Redmayne, I'm going to go with Bradley Cooper. Uh, you know, I really can't uh, disagree with that. The uh, difficulty I have with Cooper is uh, really goes in another direction. It's the following. I saw him in the title role of the Elephant Man on Broadway in December. And uh, his performance for me was just a revelation. He did he played the Elephant Man with no makeup, uh, simply with body contortions and acting. And it was so far beyond anything that I had ever conceived he could do. Um, I really still have that in my mind. And, and this role was much more restrained than I saw him in that stage role. So I'm, I'm kind of calling him out for not being as dramatic at the same time recognizing that uh, I saw one, one of the what I thought was the greatest performances ever on Broadway. But um, I'm going to go against uh, Cass a little bit here uh, and go with Steve Carroll. Um, he is uh, a well-known comedian, uh, and he played completely against type in this movie. He played one of the creepiest um, – I don't know if he was the villain, but maybe the antagonist that we've seen in a long time. Um, the other actors, uh, I could not disagree with the uh, Oscar for Michael Keaton at all, um, but I thought Steve Carell went went against most any most everything he had done previously, and that uh, in many ways uh, I thought he was the star of that movie. So uh, I'm going to go out that way on the uh, best actor, but. I think, uh, for me, the conventional wisdom is uh, Michael Keaton, but I can't disagree with you on Bradley Cooper. And, and what are your thoughts on that prosthetic nose that uh, Steve Carell wore through the whole movie? Um, you know, as uh, as uh, someone with an Italian nose, I often say to people, how do you breathe through that little thing? So it didn't bother <laughs> me one way or the other. All uh, right, it, it it just creeped the heck out of me, and it's mm. almost like you know if you're playing the elephant man, maybe they should have taken Steve Carell's nose and put it on Bradley Cooper. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's continue putting the the ladies first. Uh, best supporting actress, uh, Patricia Arquette for uh, Richard Linklater's uh, Grand Experiment, uh, Boyhood. Laura Dern, uh, another female presence in Wild. Uh, Kara Knightley, who I just think was a revelation in The Imitation Game, uh, Emma Stone, very strong in Birdman, and Meryl Streep. You can't have an Oscar without having yeah. uh, Meryl Streep being nominated. Um, I used to kind of put Kara Knightley in a box and just think that she was that little tomboy from Bend It Like Beckham. And I think uh, in The Imitation Game, she really shows a lot of range. And she's actually almost more interesting to me than uh, Benedict uh, Cumberbatch. So I'm going to go against the Patricia Arquette, uh, you know, leading the pack from the awards shows, and I'm going to go with Kara Knightley. Well, uh, that's certainly an interesting pick. Um, I think her role in that movie for me, in many ways, to find the category of, of supporting actress, clearly not the star, a um, uh, much lesser part, but within the context of that part, I thought she did very, very well, as well along the lines of your analysis. Um, and uh, I remember her from uh, King Arthur, and uh, where she wore this sort of little tank top thing and ran around and was cute. 
So that's kind of, uh, I don't know how old she was, 18 or 19 maybe when she did that movie. But um, she certainly has grown as an actress. So um, I um, I do like your call, but I'm going to go with the conventional wisdom with uh, Patricia Arquette. I think uh, the movie itself, this would be a way for the Academy to honor the movie, to honor what Linklater did, a very different uh, uh, structure. And I think... um, I'm, I'm going to, like I said, go with the conventional wisdom with her or her on this one. So um, let me cue you up now for Best Supporting Actress. Uh, same nod to that movie with Ethan Hawke or not? Um, I don't understand your question. I'm sorry. If you reward boyhood for Patricia Arquette, uh, do you also reward ah. boyhood with Ethan Hawke? You know, here I'm going to go in a completely different direction. Um I, I didn't think Whiplash was worthy of a Best Picture nomination, uh, but I did think J.K. Simmons was worthy of a Best Supporting Actor nomination, and uh, I have loved him for a long, long time. I thought he was, I think his deadpan look is just, I think he's great with physical comedy, just with his face, and he played, once again, against type. So uh, he's really my pick in this category. Um, but you have some really interesting uh, nominations, uh, you know, all the way from, from Robert Duvall down to Ethan Hawke, and, and it doesn't fill out more in kind of the scope of Hollywood actors than that range. Yeah, I would uh, I would agree with you. I, I've got J.K. down, uh, you know, not my tempo. Let's try that again. But um, I just also adore Edward Norton and Birdman. He is just such um, – you know, such an accident waiting to, waiting to happen. And from the moment he joins that cast and gets into that movie, he is really outstanding. So I also could see uh, some of these folks canceling themselves out. So, you know, like with Ethan Hawke and Ruffalo and J.K. So I'm thinking a dark horse is um, Ed Norton, but I'm going to agree with you on, on J.K. And then also thinking another uh, – way to uh, honor a career might be Duval and Judge. And I'm not sure, did Duval ever win a supporting um, Oscar for the Godfather movies, or do you know if he's been honored before? Uh, my sense is uh, yes, but uh, let's just see if we can uh, figure that out. Okay. So while, while, while you're uh, using the uh, – the, the the touring machine. <laughs> uh, I will uh, lead us off with the nominations for uh, best director, and uh, we've mentioned a lot of these folks already because uh, these films have been nominated in some of the big categories already. Well, uh, tender mercies. Tender mercies. Okay, then I then I think he's set. I don't think he needs another one. Let's go with J.K. All right. Um, so we have Texas's own um, Richard Linklater with Boyhood. And the the unique thing about this movie was it was shot uh, in pickups with the same uh, cast over many different years and uh, actually had the young boy start off as a kid and grow up into uh, uh, a teenager. Uh, Alejandro Inaratu for Birdman, um, I just think it's such a unique piece of filmmaking, and uh, I I think uh, that's my pick. Uh, Bennett Miller did Foxcatcher, uh, Wes Anderson, uh, another Texan. So this uh, this category is being dominated by Texans. Uh, As Grand it Food should be. As Hotel. it should be. And uh, finally, um, the director for The Imitation Game, uh, who I am not familiar with at all. This is his first uh, nomination, but I, I'm going to go Birdman. Um, once again, a call that I don't think uh... – Really, I could argue strongly against a a very strong field. Um, I guess my heart would go to Wes Anderson. Um, Obviously, the Texas part of me wants him to win, but more importantly, uh, he's such an iconoclast within the Hollywood community, and he does such different things, and he put together something that really, if not touched a lot of people, got a lot of people's attention. Uh, with Grand Budapest Hotel. Um, So I would really like to see him win, but uh, I'm going to go with Linklater. 
All right. And um, don't mess with Texas. Don't mess with Texas. But um, uh, because he, he, had, he did something so different, and he structured it for such a long time, and he had the p- perseverance uh, and money, resources to make it work. But your your pick, I think, would be the conventional wisdom, and uh, I don't think it can be argued against uh, too strongly. Um, it's certainly going to be a fascinating uh, ceremony. Um, any uh, Now that we've gone through this uh, kind of process, has anything jumped out at you from a compliance perspective uh, in our discussions about either Hollywood, the movies, or um, um, – Anything we've really talked about that you might want to kind of sum up with? Well, I I think um, a lot of the times when we're discussing things from an ethics and compliance stand uh, uh, perspective, a lot of the things that we talk about are kind of the rules, right? Either the do's or don't, and how to communicate those rules to people, and do you how do you teach and I think the Academy Awards are a very unique situation where there are certain rules of engagement that are understood, but they're not necessarily taught. And that would be how the awards are either divvied up amongst the the art films and we're you know, not giving the nods to any of the big popular movies like Guardians of the Galaxy. And it might also be how you might reward somebody for a body of work that have been, you know, ignored along the way. Or sometimes, uh, you know, where you get Meryl Streep that gets nominated each year. So a lot of the times we we talk about uh, tone at the top or tone at the middle, but I think the uh, Oscars and uh, the Academy Award process is, uh, is a very insular community, and I think the rules of engagement – are well documented, and I think they give these nominations out in a, in a very uh, ethical way, which is a way to try to reward everyone. And you know that is the internal ethics of this body. I'm not sure it's the best way to do it, but this seems to be the uh, you know decision making by committee. So that would be what I would pull out of what we've been discussing for the last five weeks. I guess uh, I really had a couple of thoughts. Um, the first one was through your explanation of the creative process of making the film and even the process by which the guilds get together, and review films, and make nominations in the campaigns to um, uh, after the nominations are made, leading up to the awards on Sunday, is it emphasizes once again the, the process nature of both filmmaking and the awards um, regime. And many um, compliance practitioners came to the compliance function from the legal department where they really didn't think about process. And so um, if if maybe they could ch- a lawyer could change his focus and start thinking a little bit about more about process, that's how you might burn compliance into the DNA of your company rather than just focusing on the building blocks and making pronouncements on high that, Thou shalt not give a gift of more than fifty dollars, um, something like that. So that was sort of observation one, and observation two was really more about the community and less about the Oscars, uh, because it's about Amy Pascal and uh, what can happen in an, in an insular community when you are uh, doing and saying things that may be funny within your insular community. Yet, when it gets out into the broader community, people either go WTF or what was she thinking or uh, gosh, this is horrible, Um, a lot of those kinds of things, uh, particularly in the context of the emails we saw. So um, you you described the insular nature of the community and, you know, every industry is that way. I come out of the energy space, whether you're in pharma, tech, professional football, you name it. We've all – every industry has their eccentricity. But when you go out into the real world with civilians, sometimes what you think um, you have said may be interpreted very differently. So uh, I often tell people don't put stupid stupid stuff in emails, um, and I still think that's uh, good, but uh, you really need to think about who you're saying this to and where it's going to go or where it could go. So that was really the other kind of takeaway 
for me from this series. So with that, Jay, we have concluded our five-part series. Uh, I have certainly enjoyed this. I've learned a lot about the process of filmmaking, but I've learned even more about the process of Oscar nominations and uh, the award season. So thanks for your expert guidance in this. And uh, as always, if anyone wanted to get in touch with you, how would they do so? Sure, Tom. Uh, by email, jay.rosen, R-O-S-E-N, at merrillcorp.com, M-E-R-R-I-L-L-C-O-R-P.com, and uh, via a cell phone, 310-729-6746. And uh, Tom, now that we've made our picks and uh, we'll be seeing each other next week in Houston at the uh, SCCE uh, Energy and Utilities uh, Compliance and Ethics Conference. Um, should we uh, make a, a Randall and Mortimer a gentleman's bet of a dollar uh, to see who gets the most correct picks? Uh, actually, we should go out all out and just have dinner. Have dinner, okay. Then we, we will go to dinner together and celebrate ethics and compliance in Hollywood. Great. Looking forward to it.